Well, hello there all. Welcome back. Thanks for joining me on my channel. This is going to be a little bit of a different video today where I'm just going to go over some new supplies that I got so you can check them out with me. Um, I got a new set of core watercolor paints. Um, and these I have been using for um, a couple of days since the holidays. And it's a set of 24, which is quite large for me. Um, and I've swatched these out. So I've been using these for a couple of days and I've used core prior to this, but um, individual tubes. But this is the first set of this size that I've ever used. So I'm very excited to put this set and um, make an entire core watercolor palette. So I have a bunch of tube paints, but then I also, I had to wait for this because it got messed up in some shipping uh, delays and actually got lost in the mail and then craziness got canceled and then all of a sudden showed up at my doorstep. So anyway, um, this tis the season with the holidays and all of the craziness that was going on with shipping, but it finally arrived at my door and this is a 24, um, pan watercolor palette. These are half pans. Um, and this is an aluminum palette and I'm very excited to, whoops, so sorry to build my own palette out of all core paints. Now I use a combination of Daniel Smith, Professional Windsor Newton Cotman, and some core individuals, but I'm excited to build a whole palette out of these core paints because I've been really loving the vibrancy of them. So this is really neat. Um, I like the um, kind of this barn door or trifold open where I have lots of space to mix colors out here on the sides. And then my 24 um, pans, and I think, let's check this out. This comes right out. Um, so you can take this out of the pan or out of the um, holder itself. This is F Club Watercolor Art Supplies. Um, I did get it off of Amazon, but you could definitely check out your local art store or a link to this on Amazon will be in the description if you're interested, as well as to the core paints. Um, so these pans, they pop right out of there. Look at that. So nice and easy and they snap right back in as well. So they kind of stay where you put them. Let's see if I can, there we go. So as you're building it, you know, technically you can get more, um, empty pans and fill them and store them and you can actually swap out different colors. So maybe I'll build this whole core set and then I'll decide later on, I want to switch out a few of the colors because I prefer them in Windsor Newton or Daniel Smith. Um, just like core, I absolutely love their sap green. I hate Windsor Newton sap green. Sorry, Windsor Newton. Um, but you know, there's a lot of other colors that I love of Windsor Newton and maybe I won't love as much in core. So it'll all depend on while I'm using it and what I've decided, I can always get more of these little pans that you, they're a standard size. You can order them online or find them in your local artist shop and swap them out. So that's really exciting. Now I've used a bunch of different types of palettes, but I've never had one of these where I could swap out different pans um, just by pulling it out of there. I've always had these plastic palettes that kind of have these wells in them, but once you put the color in there, it's kind of there. And these have served me really well, and I haven't used a lot of different colors, so I don't tend to switch up my colors very often. This is kind of a big deal for me with this core paint. So here's another example. And then also if I'm using a very specific palette of colors for a project or a painting, or if I'm doing a large commission, I might just take one of my ceramic, my big ceramic or butcher block metal trays and just put the colors out I'm gonna use on that um, and put them out in wet form, maybe let them dry overnight there and then just use them straight from here. So that's what I've been doing, but I'm really excited to be able to fill this. So I'm gonna fill these up with my core colors and let them dry and then maybe we will take a look at the different core paints as well and what I love about them. So stay tuned. So 
we're back and as you can see I filled my 24 palette set with all of my core watercolors um, I'm very excited to give these a try with you I've definitely used some core before and I'm really excited to have a full set of them and we'll go over what I love about core in just a moment and you can see in my 24 pan set I did let them dry overnight so they are um, not wet to the touch but you can still feel that they're a little soft they'll probably take another day or two to completely dry which is totally fine they can still be used in this um, format they don't have to be completely dry to be used you can use them right out of the tube if you want uh, you can see that some of them are a little thicker than others where some when i put them in the pan took on the full shape of the pan where others are more <coughs> so sorry excuse me Others are more of this like frosting consistency that are kind of thick and held their shape when I put them in there. I'm sure it has something to do with the formula of the pigment that is used in there, creating it um, to be a thicker paint. Okay, so So let's talk a little bit about why I love Core. Now Core by Golden is kind of a new kid on the block in terms of watercolor. Um, they are, I have a little extra burnt sienna in there <laughs> from my open stock. Um, they are relatively new, they're made in the US. Um, what I think is most unique about them and why I love them is that they are really well pigmented paint so they're very bright and vibrant they use their own proprietary binder um, versus a standard binder that you'll find in other um, standard watercolor uh, paints so you know they claim that that is what helps make them um, stay bright and vibrant and have this wonderful beautiful flow i find all of this to be true when i use them i really love them but for those looking for really subtle watercolors, this set might not be for you or this brand might not be for you. I tend to paint very bright and vibrantly and when I'm using other, other paints, I have to use a lot of layers um, to achieve that very bright and vibrant color saturation that I'm looking for, where I think with Core, I'm going to be able to get where I'm going a little bit faster um, paint a little bit more expressively. So that's just my take on them and I really enjoy them so far. Their sap green is by far my favorite sap green. It's one of the colors I use a lot, especially in landscape painting and florals. And I have found that I am just absolutely in love with their sap green, so much so I got a little tube as a gift a couple months back before I had this set. And I immediately went out and bought an 11 millimeter tube of that sap green because I knew I would use it a ton. Um, I used to, I would say prior to core, um, I primarily use Winsor Newton professional grade paints as well as Daniel Smith. My palette is made up mostly of those two brands um, with a few core in there. Now there are a ton of other brands out there that are quite popular and I'm sure there's reviews out there on them. I'm sure I will try them eventually, the White Knights and Centeliers of the watercolor um, universe, but I'm really excited about these core paints and that they're made in the US. I am a US um, resident, so, uh, so they're made here and I can get them pretty easily. So depending on where you are in the world, it might be a little harder um, to get these. All right, so let's, let's swatch these out. So I did a little swatch card with just their full colors here, and that's just for me to be able to kind of see what I have going on here rather than looking at like the color on the tube. Um, if you go on the Core website, they do have a really great um, online swatches that you can look at that really break down uh, the color for you. So that's a great resource as well. I am, instead of just putting the color out, I'm gonna swatch these out with the most saturated version and then a gradient so you can really see the full effect of the color. So let's take a look at that together. Okay, we're a little closer here so you can actually see me. So let's see here. 
Our first color is cadmium yellow. So cadmium yellow is a beautiful, bright, cheery yellow color. And you can see as I add water to it, these are still holding strong as a really bright color, especially for this usually pretty delicate color. But look how well pigmented this is. As we get lighter and lighter, it's still holding its pigment really well. So that's just a beautiful, strong, vibrant yellow color. And then Nickel Azo Yellow, another one of my favorites. I just find this beautiful earth toned yellow. I call it an earth toned yellow. I just feel like it has these go gorgeous tones of gold in it. When I paint fall foliage, this is definitely a go to to add to the to add to the palette. But then as you get um, add water and dilute this. It almost takes on qualities, if you can see, of our um, cadmium yellow. All right, so let's move on to our diorolite yellow. Now I'm used to working with, for my warm yellows, I'm used to working with um, a gamboge yellow. So this would be the closest to that. It's a very warm, yellow, very similar to like a cadmium yellow, but a little bit warmer, a little bit oranger. So these are the three main yellows that you have in here. And we're gonna get to another color in the palette, which is um, a green gold color that I have never used before, but after using it recently in a painting, it, it's just such a unique color to it. All right, so moving on to the next color in our palette. What do I have going on here? Oh, this is a quinacridone gold. So very um, orangey red with a lot of depth and texture to it. Um, a little bit of a granulation in the color. This is another one, the quinacridone gold, that painting those fall landscapes, well, I'm from the Northeast, so in the US. So our um, fall foliage is something to behold for sure in terms of Mother Nature's color palette, but this is definitely another one I would use in my fall foliage for sure. Look at that beautiful. I'm definitely in skies and sunsets, um, in sunflowers maybe, painting them. Um, trying to think off the top of my head what else I would use that beautiful color for. A million things. All right, so let's get into cadmium. This is cadmium red medium, I think, actually. I think this is going to be transparent pyrrole orange. So another beautiful orange color. Now I'm a big color mixer. I normally don't have a big palette like this. So I start with some real basics and mix my secondary colors a lot, but I'm starting to <laughs> find my way into these beautiful convenience colors because some of these aren't even convenience colors um, they really just offer something more to the painter in terms of brightness and vibrancy that you can't always get from mixing colors, even though you can kind of get the same hue. But this vibrancy that you see here, look at how just rich, even as these are drying, they're just holding their vibrancy. When I paint a lot of times, you know, especially if I'm painting with like 
Winsor Newton Cotman colors. So those are a student grade color and I use those with my students a lot because they're affordable, kind of entry level and we use a lot of paint for new beginners um, in classes. And you know, they just don't hold their vibrancy up as much as they dry. They get lighter and lighter and lighter. And then by the time it's fully dry, you realize you have to definitely use another layer to keep the vibrancy of the color from when it was put on. And that just has to do with the amount of pigment in the actual color versus binder, um, which is why they're a little cheaper. So this color is our cadmium red medium beautiful tomato, fire truck red, your traditional, what people would say, give me a red. This is that red. Not my actual favorite red in the whole color spectrum, but. So a nice, beautiful red and jumping. Now I kind of mix, I think I messed these up in the palette a little bit. I might switch these. So I'm gonna to jump to a pyrrole scarlet. So we went from really orange to a much cooler red um, versus this pyrrole scarlet, which is a super warm red. So these two, this actually would be more of the tomatoey red, I think, because tomatoes have a little bit more orangey flavor to them. But this could still be your fire truck red. <laughs> So this is the Pyrrole Scarlet. That you see. And I'm just gonna see if I can add. So this one doesn't hold up, for me, it doesn't hold up its vibrancy as well as some of the other colors. Um, as it dries, it lightens quite a bit, but that's okay. It still holds its own. Um, and then last but not least, Actually, we still have a few more. Lots of reds in this palette. So um, Permanent Alizarin Crimson is next. I'm actually gonna switch sheets and we'll start anew. So Permanent Alizarin Crimson, this is a nice cool red. I love Alizarin Crimson. I use it in a lot of, um, when I have to do a lot of color mixing, with the exception of a Quinacridone Magenta being uh, substituted in for a red. I love this one as a mixing color versus um, a cadmium red. I'm sure there are a lot of, someone out there who's gonna, who's gonna fight me on that. <laughs> I was gonna say, you should use cadmium red. Um, and then lastly here, kind of in our red, true red palette, we're gonna get to some red browns and things like that, some burnt siennas at the end, more of our neutrals, but here's our quidocridone magenta, which I love quin magenta for mixing, especially if I'm doing, um, if I'm doing skies and sunsets and things like that, this Quid Magenta really can be the star of the show if you let it. And it, it's great for mixing the purples that you might need for the sky or a sunset. It's beautiful in florals. As you can see here, as we get to the lighter end of the spectrum, you can get a really gorgeous blush pink from it. Way down here at this end that just is so lovely in florals and skin tones, and skin tones. You can use this to rosy up those cheeks or provide the red or kind of ruddiness of a skin tone that you need. Uh, let's get this little water bubble out of there. <clears throat> Okay, now we're jumping ship to the other side of the color 
we'll we're gonna head over to purples which is just next to the reds but purple and blues and then work our way into greens so they in this palette they have a diaxazine purple super strong color can definitely be in its full saturation looks very close to dark dark black um, can be added to lots of other colors to provide a depth or deep shadow but then as we get lighter and lighter this color lightens and lifts so nicely but will hold its vibrancy up here and that's really important it doesn't end up drying into this like light lavender at the top of its saturation spectrum but down here when it's well diluted can be this beautiful soft color i had a water droplet up here sorry water droplet So the diaxazine purple, great color, really rich, really powerful color. If you're mixing it with anything, you only need a little, it will go a long way. Dropping water droplets everywhere. Okay, um, and then that's gonna move us right into our ultramarine blue. A great warm blue, has lots of red undertones to it. <clears throat> Great for mixing purples. And then can be this beautiful light soft blue for skies. I do enjoy this as a mixing color. I mean, I guess it depends on what you're mixing always, but. Beautiful blue. All right, let's take a look at our next color. So this is not a color I would use regularly that I don't have in kind of any form. It's the Cerulean Blue um from this line and it's a very um i don't know why i think of this but i think of like the like original like way back in the day like superman color this like light blue cerulean color i don't know anyway i don't have this color in my palette uh, or any kind of version of something that would be this color maybe the Windsor and Newton Cotman um, Cobalt would be close to this in terms of kind of tonal value um, and hue, but this is not a blue that I regularly use. So I'm looking forward to kind of experimenting with it, seeing where I would use it. Is this gonna go in skies, in beach scenes, in floral bouquets, as a mixing color and skin tones? Uh, I don't know. I don't know why. Like on camera, it doesn't look bad, but in person to me, it doesn't look bad, but it just, it's not a color that resonates with me. I don't know why. I am so sorry, cobalt blue. I hope we learn to get along. But still, it's, it's a really lovely color. It goes on very nicely, um, nice and thick in its pigment, most pigmented form. I will point out, if you see the ultramarine blue, this is a little bit of a granulating color. I don't know if it's officially a granulating color on here, but I find when I paint with it, it starts to separate a little bit. I don't know if you can see that in the top here as it's drying. I still love this color and I do not shy away from granulation. I really love it for its texture that it provides. So just noticing that, you know, now while I'm looking at that, 
All right, so let's get on to <clears throat> the blue that all the kids who I teach absolutely love. They would paint everything in this blue if they could. Phthalo blue, the pretty blue, they call it. This beautiful, very cool, green-toned, turquoisey blue. I know you don't see a lot of green in it at first blush, but this color is leaning on the cool, or uh, yes, on the cool side, it is a very, has a lot of green undertones to it. Makes gorgeous greens, gorgeous emerald greens when you mix it with a cadmium or gamboge yellow. It's beautiful for Caribbean scenes and ocean water. But yeah, people love this blue. All right, moving on to our next set, we're gonna get into um, some interesting um, greens that I have never used before, as well as my favorite sap green, and into our neutrals, our raw siennas and burnt umbers and all of those beautiful neutral colors. So let's grab one more piece of paper to do that. And actually, right, and I actually think I'm going to need at least two more pieces of paper, this one and another, to get all these in. All right, so we're going into cobalt teal. This is another really pretty color that I don't really have in my palette at all. I haven't used it. I'm sure I've mixed something close to this color to use in something I've painted. But this is another one. I'm curious to see if I'm going to fall in love with it and use it for a ton of stuff or if it's going to be one of those colors that kind of just sits in my palette for a while. And then I switch it out for something else. So very beautiful, very fun um, kind of convenience color. This is one I feel like I could mix pretty easily from other colors. but still a very pretty color. But again, I'm just not sure what I would use it for right off the bat. Like it doesn't lend itself right away to a very specific type of subject area. Maybe oceans for sure. Um, adding it as a secondary or tertiary color in there. But leave a message in the comments if you have an idea of what you would use that for, if you really love that color and know exactly what you'd use it for right away. All right, Viridian Green. This is a very jewelry toned green. Actually, I'm not really sure. Viridian Green in uh, Windsor & Newton is. Let's see, I don't have this one in Core yet. This is my first experience with the Viridian Green in Core. Hmm. And you know, this is probably the first color where, hmm, I wonder how that looks on camera, where I feel like I'm having to add, go back in and add a lot more and it's still not giving me full coverage. At that top end, like some of the other colors that we've used, it's very transparent, which is fine. Watercolors are transparent inherently but in terms of the core watercolors and their vibrancy and like really holding their own at the top level of saturation, I don't know if this color does it. Maybe we're gonna let it dry and see. But this Viridian Green is a very jewel toned green. Has a lot of blue in it. And can definitely be used in Landscapes and garden scenes, you know, um, I would see how it works with adding a little bit of alizarin crimson to it, a touch of it to desaturate it, but I'm just a desaturated kind of girl when it comes to greens, and that's why I absolutely love this next color, which is a beautiful sap green 
which has a lot of yellow undertones to it. Much warmer green color. Now all of these spectrum. Look at that beautiful color. I find it has a tiny bit of a perceived granulation to the to the sap green. And you can get super, super light. Though I rarely use this on the super light side of the spectrum. I really just, these tones right here, like from here to here, are where I live on sap green. I absolutely love it. Love, love, love it. And taking sap green and mixing some like um, phthalo blue with it, oh, it can just be a real beautiful combination. Or indigo and sap green, oh my gosh, to get a darker tone, but that's not a darker green that kind of brings it into a shadow with more blue um, tones to it. Oh, I'm in love, love with those colors. Okay, so moving on from sap green before I really fangirl out on it. <laughs> Your biggest fan, Sap Green. All right, so this is another one of those colors I have not used or come across in my other color palettes. I've never just picked it up for any reason, but it's a green, it's called Green Gold by Core. And at first when I started painting with it, I was like, hmm, that's an interesting color. It definitely is like green gold. Like there's, it's this green that has these really rich yellow undertones to it, like super, super warm green. But then as you go down, it almost like, it really takes on a yellow quality. Like this um, area of the, the dilution spectrum here is like this kind of beautiful yellow color. So I don't know how I feel about this part up here, but this part down here, I just really love. And let's take a look at it next to some of our other yellows. So it is still very, it's a very green yellow, but it could definitely live with the yellows too. It does not have to live completely, especially this area down here with the greens. But Interesting color, again, another one. I'm curious to see if I just kind of ignore it in the palette over time or if I really start to embrace it. So we will see. Uh, moving on to, where are we? Are we in raw, raw sienna? Uh, uh, uh. Am I in raw sienna? Hold on. Yes. All right, so raw sienna, another beautiful golden wheat-like color. Very nice color, definitely can be used um, getting to your skin tones really easily. Burnt sienna, our sienna colors. If you're not mixing your skin tones directly from a primary palette, which I do a lot, um, you can definitely use the burnt raw umbers and siennas to get yourself there pretty quickly by just adding a little bit of your primary colors to them and then diluting them. So way down here, you can see is where the skin tones would probably live, um, the lighter skin tones would live. And then up here on this side, more saturated, darker skin tones, but I would definitely add other colors to these. I wouldn't use them raw as a skin tone. They get you in the right direction. All right. Beautiful. And then just a few more left.
right, just a few more left we have on our mm -mm, Van Dyke Brown. No, Raw Umber, I believe. Raw Umber coming up. I'm sorry, this paper is a slightly different type of paper than the first three I was doing, but it will be fine in terms of my scrap pieces. So this is a raw umber, beautiful, cool brown color. Van, I feel like something got switched on me. Hold on. Oh no, I guess this is, is this our Van Dyke Brown? Van Dyke Brown, it seems very red to me. But this is our Van Dyke Brown. So again, I haven't really used the Van Dyke Brown from this. Doesn't it seem much redder? It looks more like burnt sienna, but it's not burnt sienna. Because we already did burnt sienna. Okay, well, we're gonna let it dry. Maybe I just needed to add more paint. Usually the Van Dyke Brown that I'm used to is a little bit cooler than this. It's not quite as red. It's actually a little bit more neutral than this, but hey, core, making things up as you go. All right, so now one of my favorite colors, a Payne's Gray. I will say the core Payne's Gray, super, look at this, look at this dark, rich color. This is like basically black um, at its most saturated level and as you grade it out it's this beautiful gray color it's a cooler gray um, not uh, doesn't definitely doesn't have any um, kind of redness to it it's a much cooler gray I have found that the Daniel Smith Payne's gray is quite blue and that's kind of the Payne's gray I knew for a really long time and I really love that color I love the blue tint nature to it this is cooler but does not really it's much more neutral um, this Payne's gray the Daniel Smith Payne's gray is, has a much bluer tint to it which I just absolutely adore um, for different reasons so but this is a lovely neutral Payne's gray and then they also have what's called neutral tint in here again I've never used anything called neutral tint but I think it is exactly what it says it's a dark very transparent color um, but very dark bordering on black but really it is a gray that is even more neutral and you'll see yeah as we Ooh, that dried really fast. As we grade it out, you can see it is even more neutral and it makes this Payne's Gray look bluer. This is for sure a neutral, but look at how fast that's drying. I don't know, that was like superhuman fast. Maybe it's this paper I'm using, this different paper. It's not, it's only 25% cotton, I think. Or it could be something with the pigments. I don't know. So yeah, you can see this is much cooler and this is much lighter. And then last but not least in the palette is that titanium white that comes in every set. And I just got some <laughs> neutral tint in it. So you can see this is what that would look like with titanium white now titanium white does get a bad rap rightfully so I think you know you put it in a watercolor palette for a very different reason than to make white highlights but a new watercolor artist may not know that uh, when they come to learn watercolor and they may think oh that's how I make highlights that's you know 
I can put that layer on top at the end. And that's just, as you know, if you are a watercolor artist, that's not how that titanium white works. It definitely makes your other paints more opaque feeling it lightens them to a more pastel look if that's what you're trying to go for but it's not really used for making white highlights so just as an example i put some down on there let's mix some of this is this i think this is a lizard and crimson so i mixed or no quadacridone magenta i mixed my quadacridone magenta with it and you can see it's got much more of an opaque pastel -y, consistency than the full vibrancy we'll just add a little more right on top the full vibrancy of the quinacridone magenta so you can change kind of the tone of your and the opacity of your paints with the titanium white but you can't add highlights on top that is when we leave the white of the page the white of your page is the highlight of Here's a little phthalo blue. And you know, you can mix this very differently on your palette with your white, but I'm just giving you an idea. And then when I add that white to it, kind of what it does to the quality and the tone. Still kind of in the same genre of the blue, but a much more opaque flat color in that white and you might need that for something or for a style that you're trying to achieve. So poor titanium white, get in the bad rap. It's just misunderstood. It has a use, just not the one you might be thinking of when you first open that watercolor palette. So there are, let's bring all of these lovely folks back out and I'm gonna zoom out a little bit so we can get them in here. Here is the full spectrum of this 24 set core watercolor set. Now these are all dry towards the top end here with the exception of the few I just did. And you can see, look at how they hold up their vibrancy towards the top of their saturation. Um, and even as you go down into the diluted areas, they're still holding their vibrancy really well. Um, I absolutely love this set. I'm really excited to try out some of these new colors that I mentioned to see like how do they live up to expectations in my palette? Do I use them? Do I not use them? Um, so I hope you got something out of this, seeing these colors. I'll put a link in the description to where you can find these supplies um, online, or you could always check your local art store and ask if they carry the core uh, series. Uh, but I definitely recommend them if you wanna paint vibrantly, um, if you are someone who does not shy away from these really bold and bright colors in your work, this could be a game changer for you and a wonderful new set for you. So thank you so much. I'm Shana Searcy. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, leave comments in the video. It really helps my channel grow. I'm so grateful to all the subscribers that have joined me in the last couple of months. Um, I'm just over a thousand now, and that's super exciting. And I really appreciate you all coming back time and again. And if you're not a subscriber, think about subscribing and you get notifications on my videos when they are up and available. And you can always join my studio crew at shanacerci.com where you can get more exclusive content, longer videos, traceables, um, and reference photos as well. So think about that on shanasurfy.com. All right, y'all take care and enjoy the rest of your day.